Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so my name is Ben. I'm the Raspberry Pi Community Manager working at the Raspberry Pi Foundation uh, in Cambridge. Um, I'm the creator of uh, GPIO Zero, a Python library for um, interacting with the GPIO pins on Raspberry Pi, uh, which I'm going to be talking about in the talk. Uh, I write uh, a column for opensource.com, a, a community project um, that does all sorts of tutorials and articles and things, and so uh, it's, it's well worth checking out. There's lots of great material on there. Uh, there's my GitHub handle and Twitter handle on there as well, and you can reach my, me by email. So uh, we've sold over 14 million Raspberry Pis around the world now, so um, things are going really well. So I mean, I was looking back at some of the slides uh, I made uh, the first uh, EuroPython I spoke at, um, and we were sort of about three million at that point, and um, and and that was seeming really, uh, really big, and really like we'd made a, re a real big impact in the early days, and uh, it's great to see how how far we've come, and uh, and similarly the actual um, number of staff on the foundation team has grown rapidly over the last couple of years, and there was a slide I had with you know three or four people that were you know the foundation at the time. Um, and now we've grown to this great, this is from just a, a week or so ago. Uh, we had a, an all staff to get, get together and uh, it's great to see um, all the great things that we've been doing. Um, we were founded in 2009. We only started sort of hiring people around, around 2011, 2012. Um, uh, the Reservoir Foundation incorporates three organizations now. The, the trading company that makes and sells uh, the Raspberry Pi computers. Um, the, there are people who work in the foundation um, that are that are sort of purely on the um, on the education side of things, um, but then there's also uh, Code Club and Code Dojo, two um, sub organisations that we uh, that we run um, in uh, pro providing opportunities for young people to get involved in programming, learning about technology, learning about computers and digital making um, all around the world. Um, the Raspberry Pi Trading um, operate uh, company operates uh, as a way to feed their profits into um, funding our educational programs. That's how our business model works, and it's, um, it's doing really well, um, as you can see. Um, the Raspberry Pi Foundation's mission is um, about putting the power of digital making into, ha into the hands of people all over the world, so that people are capable of understanding and shaping an increasingly digital world, able to solve problems that matter to them, both as makers and entrepreneurs, and equipped for jobs of the future. Now, that doesn't just mean people learning to be software developers, go and work for Google and Intel and pe people like that, but actually um, preparing people for a better understanding of technology, whatever field they end up going into work in. Uh, and we do this by providing low-cost, high-performance computers. We run education programs and do a lot of outreach activities. Um, we provide free resources to it for everybody and, and provide teacher training, uh, both in person, so people can apply to come on one of our training courses, uh, and, uh, and we actually deliver training online, so anybody can join in. Um, we're not limited to the number of people delivering the training in, in the team. Take a look at the, um, uh, the current models of Raspberry Pi. Again, this is something we've come a long way since uh, my first EuroPython talk, but uh, the Raspberry Pi 3 is our sort of main headline product. Uh, it's a 64-bit quad-core, ARM V8 running at uh, 1.2 gigahertz with a gig of RAM, and that's our $35 product. Which is the main product that we sell has always been um, $35, so we've, over the years we've improved the, the quality and the, and the power and the spec of that, um, that main headline device, um, and this is, uh, but keeping the price the same, so that's where we've, we've got um, on the main product. Um, a couple of years ago we introduced the Pi Zero, which is a $5 version of the Raspberry Pi. It uses the Raspberry Pi 1 chip, um, at, a, at a faster clock speed, um, so you've got a, a gigahertz there rather than the 700 meg that the original Pi ran at. It's got half a gig of RAM, and that one's, um, as I say, that one's five dollars. Um, not as powerful as the Pi 3, um, but certainly really useful in certain maker product products and uh, projects that you can uh, embed something you want to embed the Pi inside. We recently introduced a $10 variant, which has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, so you, a, a lot more scope for. Um, for connectivity in your projects as well. So that's where we're at on the product side. Uh, and in, in terms of the, the software, so um, again, uh, in sort of 2012 when the Pi came out, we, had, um, we were in a place where we had a sort of bog standard LX, LXD theme, looked really, really um, uh, traditional uh, Linux desktop, 
Um, and we've done a lot of work recently on improving that and making that skin look really nice, but still be really performant. Uh, it's a very, a very basic sort of thing. There's no 3D acceleration or anything special going on there. It's, it's, it's just uh, doing, doing what it does well, um, providing you with access to the education tools and, and some of the software and, and things in there. Uh, it's looking really nice, a nice set of icons and things. Uh, we, we also uh, recently released um, this desktop, uh, this operating system for desktop PCs. So we provide an x86 uh, image you can download, you can run in VirtualBox or stick it on a USB stick and actually run um, a live, di live image on a, on a laptop or PC uh, or Mac. So you can, actually, um, you can actually boot this up and get the sort of near enough the same experience you'd get in terms of software on, on the Raspberry Pi without the additional hardware and the physical computing I'm going to be talking about, um, but actually get access to um, things like Python and, um, and other software tools and other programming tools in this isolated environment that you can boot from a USB stick. And if you really like it, you can install it as your main operating system. Um, we, we've talked for a long time about moving on from Idle, um, which is the, uh, the main uh, education-focused editor provided is actually sort of bundled with Python if you download Python from, from, the, web, for the, from the Python website. Um, so we've talked about for a long time about moving on from this and finding, finding a replacement, finding something more suitable. Um, we've, um, as an intermediate measure, we've introduced a new IDE called Thonny, which is now installed, pre-installed in Raspbian. Um, Idle is still there, um, as a, a lot of textbooks and things sort of point to that, but, um, and it's, you know, it, is, it does work. Uh, to a certain extent, so it's, it's still useful, but um, there's an alternative there. It's a Python 3 only editor, there's no options, which is really helpful for, uh, for education. Um, and it's got some great um, debugging tools and, and various other features. Um, but on, uh, on the longer term, we're um, investing in developing uh, the Mu editor that Nicholas Tolovey has been working on. So we're, um, we're working with Nick um, with a, a list of specifications from our um, uh, feedback from teachers and um, some of the, the teachers that we have, have on staff uh, that are feeding into what an, a Python editor should, should look like for education. And it's something you know, that kids and teachers will start with and they may move, move on to um, uh, more, more complicated, more complex IDEs, uh, more powerful tools, but we hope that this is a great start. Uh, you can read about that, about that on uh, Nick's website as well. So. Um, Going into physical computing, so the main aspect that makes um, <clears throat> the Raspberry Pi different from regular computers is the, is the GPIO pins. That's the uh, general purpose input output. Um, there's a, a bank of 40 pins, and you can see there's a little port label there that labels the pins that have different, different purposes. Um, so physical computing is all about connecting up flashy lights, motors, robots, sensors, photo video, and enabling you to do uh, get into the Internet of Things, do home automation and physical projects. So if you take a look at that um, bank of GPIO pins, this is what it looks like. Um, this is a little handy guide from a website called pinout.xyz, which is a really useful reference if you're uh, hacking with a Raspberry Pi. So there are, um, there are mostly three volt pins. There's two five volt pins. If you want to do something ro with uh, robotics and motors, you want, you want, um, a f you'll probably want a five volt supply. Um, the, the GPIO pins are all numbered, so you can individually trigger certain pins by, by their number to go high or low, um, and they're variable 3v3, they're 3.3 volts. Um, we also provide, um, there's also a, a set of other protocols you can use um, that uh, for high-speed data transfer um, buses and things like that that allow you to do um, more, more complicated uh, than just turning individual pins uh, high and low. You can actually do a lot more by sending data uh, of high speeds down the pins using these different protocols. Um, so there's various ways you can sort of access the pins. You can either um, wire things directly to the pins or use a breadboard. Um, actually uh, make, make up your electronic circuits um, by connecting things directly to the pins using jumpers, uh, jumper cables. So you can do something like this. Um, and people also make um, accessories that you um, that actually place on top of the pins that sit neatly on uh, a bit like an Arduino shield, if you're familiar with that kind of thing. Um, we have this uh, standard called hat, which means hardware attached on top, and it's for the 40-pin header, uh, and it sits neatly on the on the Pi with mounting holes in the right place, and, um, and it's designed to um, um, to just be a sort of neat, um, neat sort of standard way of, of providing add-ons. 
Um, and there's also, um, uh, you, can, you, can, you, you, you are expected to have an, uh, an EEPROM on a hat, which is a way of, you can program a, a device to tell the Pi, in the, in the, tell the device tree what is attached so that it can do something according to what, what hardware is attached. Um, so if you, were, if you used um, any GPIO in the early days of Raspberry Pi, there's a library called RPI GPIO in Python. Um, there's a very low level library um, and it was used for uh, three or four years um, as the, the sort of main way, the canonical way um, of, of doing GPIO programming from everything from uh, flashing LEDs to robotics and, and sort of IoT home automation stuff. Um, it's quite verbose, lots of boilerplate code and so um, one of the things that I worked on was this GPIO zero library which abstracts away the, um, uh, the components and the devices into, into, these, into these classes that you can um, uh, easily easily uh, write code which talks about what you're doing with the devices rather than what you're doing with the pins. Uh, this makes it a lot easier, so you get something like this rather than the um, sort of sending n pin numbers that you keep passing around high and low, actually talk about what you're doing to the device, the, uh, in this case the LED. And then you even get into things like this, uh, where you have a, a, th a threaded blink, uh, you know, uh, you have a, a blink thread sort of running in the background, um, which just means uh, you can, you can Hack, hack on more um, devices uh, much more easily and get, get going with your project. Uh, the GPIO Zero li library supports all sorts of different um, devices, um, everything from sort of basic components, buttons, LEDs, um, ultrasonic distance sensors, um, uh, analog digital converters, uh, remote control sockets, uh, traffic lights and robots and motors, servos, and a few different um, sort of bespoke hats and add-on boards that uh, we um, provide composite device classes for. Uh, so there's a great, um, this isn't even in the, the latest version actually, but the, um, the device hierarchy in GPIO is quite interesting. Um, it's all in the documentation if you want to take a look. Um, so the, uh, one of the great things about um, the way that uh, GPIO allows you to get started is um, you can start with really simple code that, that's very easy to read and write uh, and understand. So if I was, um, if I wanted to get a, an LED connected up to a button so that the, the button actually activates the LED, and I'm starting with a, a child or a teacher for the, who's doing this for the first time, I would write something, I would show them to write something like this. It's very simple to understand um, procedural code. Um, you can progress on to um, other paradigms. So looking at event-driven uh, programming, you, can, you, you do the exact same um, setup where you've created your, your LED, you've created your button, um, but you, you have it fire off these events uh, based on um, w uh, when, these, when these things happen. So when the button is pressed, it fires the LED to on method. When released, LED to off. Um, and then you can go off and do something else. You're not stuck in a while loop. And you can even progress onto an even shorter um, version of code uh, where you're using the declarative paradigm. And again, all of this just happens in the background in, uh, in threads. Um, setting the source of the LED to the button, the, the values of the button, does the exact same as both of these other examples. But it's a, in a declarative way, you've declared in one line how the, the devices should behave. And it, you, there's some really interesting stuff you can do with this paradigm. So um, just to explain how that, how that works, um, if we got um, a device like a, a PWM LED is actually just um, a regular LED that you configure to um, use pulse width mod modulation to control the brightness rather than just turning it on and off. Um, and if we inspect um, LED.value, um, we, we can see that that's uh, zero. So rather than being true or false like a regular LED would be, um, a PWM LED has a zero to one uh, value, which is the level of brightness. Um, if we run LED to on, we actually change that, and then we inspect the value, it's now changed to one, but you can also set that to zero, which will, which will do the same as running LED to off. So that's what dot value is. And uh, what you find is that if you have two components that have the same value set, so like zero to one, so a potentiometer connected to a, like a, a, a rotary dial connected to an analog digital converter um, chip, the MCP308, um, they both have a value zero to one. So things like LED and button both have true false values. You can pass one into the other. So doing this LED dot value equals pot dot value sets it once so that the, the LED brightness matches wherever the, the dial is at that, that given time. And what you end up doing is um, writing while loops like this to say, oh, I, want, I always want the, the LED to be um, 
the brightness of the LED to be controlled by the potentiometer. And so this is where the source values thing comes in. So everything has a dot value, whether it's an input or an output. Um, and then it has a, they also have a dot values plural, which is um, an, a generate, it's just a generator constantly yielding the current value. Uh, so every time you ask for it, you, uh, the next one you get uh, a, the, the dot value. Devices that can have their um, state set, their value set, have a dot source, and that's just a way of saying, where do I get my values from? So you can pass in, like the most obvious case is to pass in the dot values, because it just takes any iterator, so in this case a, a, an infinite generator yielding the, the value of the device into the other device, and it just means that they're connected, which makes this, um, which makes this work. You can also process values in between uh, as they come out from out of one device into the other. So you can, provide, you can write your own function to do something in between. Um, we also provide a set of um, commonly used tools, so things like negated is an, uh, an e easy example. So negate the uh, Boolean value as it comes out of the button, pass that into the LED. It means you have reverse logic of when the button is not pressed, the LED is on, when the button is pressed, um, it's off. Uh, you can also combine values. For instance, if you have uh, two buttons and an LED, and you want the LED to be on if both buttons are pressed, then you take both sets of values and them essentially using this all values function. Um, and you can do this with any number of devices. And as long as all of them are true, um, or both of them in this case are true, then the LED, uh, LED's value is true. So a really neat way of um, creating an, an AND logic gate uh, using GPIO components and just a few lines of code. A um, couple of other examples using this, the same sort of paradigm. Um, we, have, uh, we have an LED bar graph class, so there's a, uh, that's the idea that you would have several LEDs in a row, and as well as, um, um, as, well as just being able to, um, uh, we, there's, a, there's a class called uh, LED board, which is just a series, any, an arbitrary series of LEDs. LED bar graph is one where you can set its value from zero to one, and rather than arbitrarily um, index LEDs, you set the value zero to one, and it lights up that many LEDs up to the maximum. So if you set it to 0 0.5, half of them will be up in a, in a bar graph sort of sense. Um, and so we have a, an, another class called CPU temperature. So there's a few, there's a few classes in the library that are um, uh, what we call internal devices rather than GP, sort of GPIO components, um, but they have the same properties and they can connect up to other devices. So CPU temperature, you can read the temperature, like it's a temperature sensor, actually get the um, Celsius value. Um, but you also get a dot value of that, which is um, a, a zero to one on the scale that you've provided on the, uh, on the init. So uh, if it's halfway between 50 and 90, for instance, then your LED bar graph will be half lit. And, and you can see that go up and up and down as you, as you do different things on the, on the device um, but the, as the CPU temperature is going up and down. And similarly, um, what one called ping server, which just runs a ping and returns a true or false value of how, how the ping went. Um, so you create a ping server on google.com. Uh, another thing you can do is set the source delay, which means how often it goes and looks for the next value if you don't want to be pinging Google as, much, as many times as you would be reading a potentiometer value or something. If you just want to do this once a minute, you'd set the source delay to 60. Um, set the value of the um, green LED to, the, to equal the Google values, and set the red to be the opposite of the green LED. So as, w as well as doing um, negated Google values, instead of doing negated Google values, I'm just negating the actual LED rather than uh, looking at that up twice. So uh, either the green is on or the red is on according to whether uh, it can ping Google successfully. Just a little status monitor. Um, there's an add-on board called Energini, which is a, a little remote control socket um, that uh, the add-on board talks to via, via radio. Um, this is um, at home. I have a pet tortoise. And uh, this is another internal device class, the time of day um, that you set up and say, uh, this time of day is active between 8 AM and 8 PM. And then you say that the lamp, which is connected to the Energini socket, should be on between those times. Um, and again, you could use a, a procedural paradigm for this and just say, while true, keep checking, or, or something like that. I use the event-based, um, that when, when this time is activated, 
then run this function, but this is another way of doing it. Um, another thing that we do is um, support multiple pin libraries. So when I said before about RPI GPIO, um, this was um, um, this is one the one that people were choosing to use. So previously, if you wanted a different um, if you wanted to use a different library because it had a specific um, feature that you the one, one of the other ones didn't, you would have to rewrite your code into that library. What we do is we provide multiple backends that you just elect which um, pin library you use, and you get the features of that library. Um, so Alpine GPIO is the default. It's sort of the most commonly used and in some ways the most stable. Um, that's installed by default in Raspbian, so that's the one uh, that's de by default elected to be used. Um, there's a couple of others, um, uh, other GPIO libraries that we support. Um, and we also provide a, a native um, pin implementation, which is kind of experimental, but it, it works for basic things. Um, but it's fallback if you haven't got anything else. And there's also... Um, uh, a mock interface, so we, which we use in our test suite, but it is quite handy for being able to just test that your code is sort of uh, is sort of valid. Uh, and both of these, the native and the mock pin, are um, are included in the library. You don't need an extra module like you do with the others. Um, so PyGPIO is one of the the libraries. It's um, implemented in C um, and runs as a daemon on the Pi. Um, it will it will allow um, remote socket connections that control the, the GPIO pins. So using the GPI0 API and the, nice, and the nice code you can write, you can actually um, control a Pi over the network and actually run this from your PC as GPI0 could be installed on, on any machine because it can be used in this way. It doesn't have to be a Raspberry Pi, but it will con can control um, the GPIO pins of a Pi using the Pi GPIO daemon. And so for instance, there's one way of doing it is if you, um, you use the Pi GPIO factory um, to create um, a, a sort of connection to a, a Pi that has the daemon uh, running. And rather than creating an LED just on a pin number, um, you, you associate it with that, uh, with that device, so with that, with that pin factory. And then the rest of the code is exactly the same. Um, and alternatively, with um, some code that would, uh, like on the right here, that would be used um, normally for um, uh, running a, 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 a running the, using the pins directly on, on the Pi, um, you can actually, so yeah, you, with that exact code that um, uh, unchanged, just with some environment variables set, you can actually have it execute the GPIO commands uh, uh, over the network. So you could change that, um, the, the, the IP address there before you run it again, and it would execute the same code unchanged on a, on a different device. Uh, here's just an example of um, using mock pin. Um, so I do this quite a lot on my laptop just to test that some code I've written for some documentation or something is, uh, is accurate. Um, so if you launch the pin factory mock um, and then open your, your, your Python shell, um, you can um, it, you know, import something from GPIO 0, create an LED. Um, here's an example where I've just said LED.blink. I've had a look at, I've inspected the value and then you know, a second or so later inspected it again and you can see that it's in the background, it's doing the, all the things that the devices should be doing. And as I say, we use this in our test suite, but it is quite handy just to be able to test your own code uh, without wiring up components. Um, and another way, another thing you can do is, um, is you can drive the um, input pins. So if you create a device which is um, using an input pin, um, you can tell it, you know, because there's no way of telling it that the, um, that a, you know, there's no way of actually pressing a button that you've created in, um, uh, that's connected to a mock pin. But if you access the pin and drive it high or low, you can actually affect the state of that button. Um, so again, this is how we, how we test things in the library. Um, but really handy just to be able to test out. Um, so in, yeah, in the, in the next um, release of GPI0, we, um, we'll, we'll come with this um, handy pinout command line tool as well. Um, so one of the things we do is inspect um, the, the device you're on, to sort of find out some information about it and what, what sort of pins you have, what hardware you have, and allows you to do, so, um, will warn you if you can't do something, if you try to access a pin that your model doesn't have or something like that. Um, and we use, we use that bank of information to provide this um, command line tool. So regardless of what model Pi you're on, it will show you the, the pinout um, for, uh, for that particular device um, and a little ASCII art diagram of the, of the Pi itself. You can also request um, to look at other, other models by looking up their revision code and seeing what the pinouts or what the, the spec of one of the other uh, devices is, 
one of the other models. And so um, one of the um, one of the uh, most popular hats uh, out there is, is one that we make uh, called the Sense Hat. We made this especially for a, an educational program. Um, there are two Raspberry Pis on the International Space Station um, with one of these um, sensor boards attached, and they're in these great space-grade aluminium cases. Uh, they went up with um, British astronaut Tim Peake um, for this uh, Astro Pi mission. Um, this was uh, an opportunity for opportunity for um, children in schools in the UK and, and later all around Europe um, to write code in Python which would be run on the space station. Um, the board has um, a bunch of sensors so you can look at the temperature, pressure, humidity, um, uh, pressure, um, accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer um, and there's an LED matrix that you can program and there's a little joystick that you can, um, that you can use to, as input as well. So it's a really great um, board for all sorts of different purposes. Um, so it, it just goes on the on the Pi directly like that. That's what we were talking about hats earlier. Um, so just a couple of examples. So um, you can write scroll text across these um, um, the uh, the LEDs. You can scroll text across it, or show um, show letters, or show information on there, or just arbitrarily access the the pixels individually and make your own patterns and icons. Um, you can um, in, easily Get, get access to the um, uh, the sensor data just just by reading the properties on the on the object, and uh, you can do stuff like this where you um, show um, you show a value of um, one of the sensors in 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 terms of which LEDs are lit. So have a kind of a bar graph if you like of um, LEDs according to something like the temperature or the humidity. And so the uh, the Astro Pi program uh, will be in its um, third year this year, and uh, we've, we've, we're, we'll be on our third astronaut that's run the program. So Tim Peake um, uh, from the UK, uh, Tamar Pesquet from France, and then there'll be another European astronaut um, running the program um, uh, in the in the next term. So this is a competition that anybody, um, uh, any kids from schools in Europe um, can enter, and the, there's various different levels of. Um, what they can do. They don't have to do anything too complicated, but um, anything from tiny little scripts which um, interact with the astronauts or show them messages or read the sensors and tell them something uh, or a game that they can play or something that they can in interact with. Um, we've had some really interesting entrants and some of them are doing some really cool sort of science, science experiments and actually logging the data and then running the experiments again at home to, c to compare the results and actually learning about thinking about space. Um, we actually have two um, emulators for this. This is one of the things we did to try and engage um, more people um, uh, in, into the program, actually, without having to buy Raspberry Pi, without having to buy Sensats, um, or even if a classroom only has one or two uh, that they can, the real hardware they can use, the rest of the class can participate in this. Um, so on the, the website trinket.io, which, re which is really great on its own for um, doing uh, Python stuff in the browser, um, there's actually a special um, mode of it that if you import the sense hat module, you, um, it brings up a, uh, an emulation of what the sense hat looks like. And you can program the LEDs using exactly the same API um, or using their Python in the browser. Um, you can also use the s sliders. So this is a really good way of just testing your code as well. That um, if you write some code that says when the temperature gets over you know, 80 degrees, this should happen. There's no way of easily sort of getting your Pi to read over 80 degrees, so in order to just test it, you can do something like this. There's also a desktop emulator that um, comes in Raspbian, but you can you can install this on your PC as well, um, run it offline. Um, again, it, you can access the, the joystick and the sensors and control the LEDs, really good way of, of testing our code out and, and having a go at doing something like a science experiment without having access to the hardware. So you can enter the competition um, with just having used this um, freely available software or the, the Trinket um, web service. Um, the Pi camera is one of the, um, the other really interesting things about the Pi. Um, so the Pi has a CSI port um, for connecting up um, a camera module, because the Pi originally came from a, a mobile phone chip, um, and it had access to um, two cameras um, for the front and back facing camera. And so using one of the, the sort of camera modules you would, you would get in a mobile phone, um, you can actually um, access the camera, run, uh, do photo and video um, in 1080p, um, full HD 
photography, um, but actually use, use your programming to control when pictures are taken or change the configuration and settings in, in real time according to sensor data and things like that. Uh, there's a basic command line interface that, um, that you can use and, and, a, and a brilliant Python library that has a really nice API for, uh, for controlling the camera. As an example, just um, some Python code that would capture an image and record video. Um, and if you want to hook it up with um, some GPIO components, say um, wait for a button, button to be pressed before taking your picture. Um, again, it's just uh, very straightforward. Um, it should be, feel very familiar if you've um, if you used, used um, any sort of neat, uh, Python APIs before. Um, there's, there's a lot of um, interesting stuff in the library that you can access that the, um, that the Pi camera gives you that, um, um, that, that are really interesting to play with. So um, there's a whole list of uh, image effects that it, that it allows to, uh, you to use so you can kind of do interesting stuff like this, um, use all these different image effects. And um, uh, you can also um, stream over the web quite easily. So one of the recipes in, in the Pi Camera documentation shows you how to do this, and there's a, a sort of more complex version in this GitHub project that's um, there's a really interesting way of, of being able to um, to stream your your uh, camera footage over the web. So this is, again, this is the, the second project that I, that I have on the Pi that's uh, connected to my t my torches table. And there's a lot of people doing um, really interesting stuff with um, Pi Camera and OpenCV. So this um, this blog, PiImageSearch.com, is full of tutorials um, and um, just, um, and setup guides and uh, and things on how uh, how to do you know facial recognition and, and, and object recognition and, and actually you know l learn about that kind of um, that kind of area um, using using the Raspberry Pi and, and OpenCV uh, using Pi Camera. Um, so do take a look at the, um, the documentation for some of those projects. The, um, the GPI Zero Docs are on Read the Docs, and you've got the um, SenseHat um, library, and Sense EMU is the desktop emulator, um, and then uh, Pi Camera as well on, on Read the Docs. They all have uh, really good documentation. Um, so uh, we uh, we have a magazine called the Magpie. Um, uh, you may be familiar, and we we once gave away. Um, the, uh, the Pi Zero came sort of on the on the front cover of the uh, the magazine. It was the, the first time a, a computer magazine had ever were given away a free computer with the with the magazine. Um, and we d we do some really interesting stuff with the magazine as well. It's just it's out every month, and um, you know there's projects and articles and um, and interviews and things. Um, hundred pages every month, and it's it's really great. Uh, but we do some really interesting things like the giveaway with the Pi Zero and. Um, one of the things we did recently was we teamed up with Google and they put together a, um, uh, they made a hat uh, called, the, the, called the voice hat and you've got this um, cardboard um, foldable um, container that you put the, uh, the Raspberry Pi, the hat and a speaker inside. Um, it has a big button on the top and you essentially make your own, you know, sort of Google Home Assistant. Um, so you can speak into this and have it process um, your thing, use the Google Assistant to, um, um, you know, to give you an answer the same way you would ask. Um, ask your phone or ask your um, one of these devices at home. Um, ask it a question or ask it for to use something, uh, some web service or something. But you can also um, write write Python code which um, processes the the commands, the voice commands, um, and you can you can use custom commands to to do stuff, which could include say GPIO stuff or camera stuff. So turn the lights on or make the robot go forward, take a picture, that kind of thing. So some really interesting projects people have been doing that with that recently. Um, and you can check out the um, uh, stuff on our blog and, and, and in the Magpie's blog, and uh, and some follow-up articles in the Magpie as well, and on the uh, AIY Projects website. That's um, so that stands for uh, uh, AI Yourself, Artificial Intelligence Yourself. Um, it was a really great project that Google did. Um, so one of the things um, I just want to mention briefly is the. Um, um, is a little side project I've been working on. I, I gave a lightning talk on it yesterday. You can check out my slides online. Um, is that uh, based around the problem that um, PyPy doesn't up support uploading ARM wheels? So when, when you actually so Python wheels, if, you, if you're not familiar, the the way of um, um, providing pre-built binaries for your for your Python packages, um, and you can upload pre-built versions to PyPy, but the um, um, they, if, they're, if they're written in C, then they have to be, when, when they're built, they're, they're compiled, they're compiled for the architecture that they were, 
they were built on. And so um, you have to provide one for each architect, type of architecture you want to support. Windows 32, Windows 64, Mac, Linux 32, 64, and so on. Um, and uh, ARM is a completely different, um, different platform. So, um, <coughs> um, so um, even though you can actually build um, wheels for, for ARM that run on the ARM architecture yourself, you can't uh, distribute them easily using PyPy. So what I've done is um, written some software which um, automates building of all, these, um, of all the packages on PyPy and provides them in a, um, uh, in, in a repository that you can install from. Um, so yeah, t check out the uh, more details in my um, in my speaker deck, uh, or come speak to me about it if, you, if that sounds interesting to you. Um, so there's lots of different ways um, you can get involved in all the stuff I'm, I'm, I've been talking about. Um, so one of the great things is, uh, you know, if, if you have Raspberry Pis at home, or if you if you choose to buy them, you know, anything you do that um, anything you do with it, I mean, making projects or just learning stuff yourself or Getting into um, you know the electronic side and the physical computing side is re you know is really great, um, and we love to see more people learning in you know things that they wouldn't otherwise be learning, um, and actually doing some really interesting stuff. Um, but you can you can also contribute to some of these libraries that I've been talking about. It'd be great to um, have some more eyes over um, cast some more eyes over some of the some of these projects, um, and help help other people. Um, upgrade their modules to Python 3. That's um, a real problem for us sometimes in, in the education world when we're trying to use Python 3 and we end up getting stuck and having to go back to Python 2 for a specific uh, module that hasn't been ported. Um, uh, there's, there's been some really interesting open source projects and Python libraries for, um, for Raspberry Pi things like Pi Camera. Um, so uh, yeah, anything like that that you're interested in making, or, you know, we, c we can end up using it in our, our educational resources because that's where um, the inspiring projects come from. Um, so yeah, do take a look at the source code for some of these libraries, and uh, if you want to take a look at um, um, contributing, that would be that would be really great. Um, as I say, I mentioned the Magpie. So this is a, a magazine you can at, you can buy in the shops, but you can also download for free. It's one of the things we do try try to get um, our stuff, uh, the stuff that we do, the, the educational programs, the, uh, the hardware and the software, out to as many people as possible. That's why we write the emulators. It's right why um, we provide the x86 image of our um, our distro. Um, we provide pre free PDFs of, of the Magpie as well, and we do a, a series of books that we also sell. Um, and we encourage people to try and um, uh, pay for them if if if, if they uh, if they if they're able to, because um, it helps fund our, our educational programs. The same way the Raspberry Pi um, sales help, uh, but you can also download them for free, so they're freely available. If you want to run workshops, you want to go and um, um, do something like this in the community. The, um, this kind of thing is is really great, um, a great resource, as, as well as the resources on our website. Um, so one of the things I'm involved is um, in a, a lot lately is um, the, the network of Raspberry Jams. So these are um, free um, community events um, that um, anyone's allowed to set up. So they're completely independent from the foundation. We just promote and support them. Um, there's a lot of family-friendly events, so they're not necessarily kind of tech user groups like the, the Maybe you have Python user groups at home. Um, but some of them are, um, which, is, which is great as well. But a lot of them are sort of focused around um, not just uh, kids learning, but it, for anyone to um, get access to um, having a go and learning some programming skills and learning about technology through uh, digital making. Um, there's a guidebook available that I put together um, that helps people start their own, um, their own Raspberry Jams. And um, you can contact me about setting one up as well and get some support from, from us. So do take a look at the Raspberry Jam um, page on the website, which has a map of where all the jams take place around the world. So have a look if there's one near, near you, if there, or if there has been one um, uh, near you, and, and maybe you could um, go along to it, or if you have kids, take them along to it and, um, and learn with them and actually um, work together. There's some really interesting stuff that um, you see a lot of families um, doing together at, at these events. Um, and Danielle will be um, pleased to see a few, a few of those uh, here in Africa as well. Um, so Code Club, is, as I say, is one of our projects. So um, this is a really easy way of, of, get, of doing some volunteering that, that has a really big impact on local children. So if you have kids in, in school, um, you can go along to their school and say, I'd like to run a Code Club. Um, there's projects provided, so you don't have to come up with your own, you don't have to write your own materials. You can use um, some materials that have been created by um, by educators at the foundation, 
Um, there's training support provided. Um, and if you just want to um, try and do your bit to try and help um, uh, help kids learn um, that you know they do their first, write their first lines of code and do some really interesting projects, then this is a great way to get involved. Um, and there's information on the Code Club World website about the different initiatives in different countries around the world. Um, we also provide a, a means for you to contribute translations so we can actually reach more people with our materials as well. So that's something, you, you, again, you can get involved with. And that's all. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much for the talk. Um, any, we have a few minutes for questions, so any questions? Do you know off the top of your head of any specific projects that need help porting to Python 3? Uh, oh, there was one that was my go-to one that's just, just been ported, which is really good news. Um, I, I can't think off the top of my head. I'll, we're, we're, we're getting better, aren't we? So it's, uh, that's good. I should perhaps make a sort of hall of shame type thing for um, Raspberry Pi spe um, specifics, but uh, sorry. okay. Do you know of some industrial projects, uh, including the Raspberry Pi, or would you recommend to do that? Yeah, um, so uh, we, we sort of sell Raspberry Pis into three, uh, three main markets. The um, industrial market, where people are using them in automation in factories and things like that, um, into um, the hobbyist community, people making projects at home, sort of thing you'd see at Maker Faire, and, and into education. Um, so three very distinct and very, um, but very interesting communities. Um, in industry, you see, um, so we actually use Raspberry Pis in the Raspberry Pi factory to test Raspberry Pis. Uh, so as they come off the production line, there's a, there's a Pi that just does a basic electronic test to make sure it's come out right. Uh, Arduino actually do the very same thing. So they have a Raspberry Pi at the end of the production line and they test, they do some electronic test on the Arduino to uh, do the same thing. Um, and we see other people doing, doing similar things with, with their own products. You see um, a lot of people actually building a product around the Raspberry Pi, either the, the single board computer that you would buy the $35 one, or um, the industrial compute module that we provide, which is a, a Raspberry Pi chip on a, in a sort of embeddable form factor that you can build your own I.O. board. And uh, you know, if, you've, if you're building a smart TV or something and you want, it, you know, you want um, a well-supported sort of Linux platform in the TV, then you, you, know, you, you can build a baseboard and have as many HDMI ports or whatever else it is that you want and put them in exactly where you want them, build your product around it and then um, buy the compute module and just slot that in and, and you've got sort of all of the hardware support for Raspberry Pi for free. Um, so there's, there's lots of people doing things like that. So one that comes to mind is um, a big company called NEC who make big stadium TV displays. They're actually shipping like, you know, um, 70, 80, 90, 100 inch TVs with the compute module embedded inside them. And one of the things about that is that they, uh, they can, you can design a board like that for um, today's Raspberry Pi, um, sort of the, whatever, whatever the model is at the time, and any future upgrades of Raspberry Pi, when the compute module becomes available, you can start shipping those ones uh, instead without having to change um, anything. So it's just, a, it's, it's actually a sodium like RAM connector, so the, the the device, the module, just slots in to a baseboard that supports that sort of well-supported um, um, hardware component. Yeah, there's lots of lots of things like that. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one more quick question. Uh, an extension to the last question: um, What about real-time? programming with a Raspberry Pi, I guess, with uh, Linux and especially with Python, you don't, uh, you are not able to fulfill uh, hard real-time requirements, so is there any alternative that you know is typically used or is, are there plans in this direction or is yeah, this so completely out of scope? 
No, so there's, um, there's definitely a ways um, that you can use a Raspberry Pi in a project where you, you need the real time, um, you need real time stuff. So uh, a good way of doing that is pairing it up with something like an Arduino. So if you, if you sort of want to be able to write your programs in Python and, uh, or something like that, something high level, um, or maybe they talk to some internet, some web services, or do something like that that you couldn't necessarily easily do with, with an Arduino on its own. Um, but actually write all that logic and all that um, programming in on the Raspberry Pi, but then send off the bits that you need doing, you know, doing real time um, to the Arduino or any you know, micro microcontroller. So that's something you see a lot of people do is they, they say like, oh, I did all this, this, and this in the Raspberry Pi, but the sudden search, you know, the um, things like NeoPixel grids or something where you need precise timing, and if you've got like loads of other programs running, you know, you, there's a chance that it, the timer will go off or something, whereas ship it off to an Arduino, tell that what to do, and let that do the, the, the sort of heavy lifting on, on that part of the, the project, but actually still controlled by all the stuff and written in high level languages like Python on the, on the Pi. Um, that's one option. Um, um, a lot of people prototype with, um, with stuff like this as well, and then you know, perhaps they'll, they'll do a proof of concept using a Pi, but then the real product will use something else, so there's, yeah, there's a few different options, yeah. Okay, we are out of time. Thank you very much for talking again. Thank you.